Interested in more cinema of meaning? Each month we have an entire bonus episode available exclusively on our creator-owned streaming service, Nebula. So far we've talked about Sam Mendes' 1917, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, 2001, A Space Odyssey. In addition to those and any future bonus exclusive episodes, you'll also get access to our regular episodes ad-free and a week early when you listen on Nebula. The best way to get Nebula is with the Curiosity Stream bundle. You can learn more about that in the description below or go to curiositystream.com slash cinema of meaning. You can even plug the Nebula feed into a normal podcast player and listen wherever you like. Sign up today to get more cinema of meaning and access to all the other great content on Nebula. Welcome to Cinema of Meaning, the podcast from myself, Thomas Flight, and fellow video essayist Tom Vanderlinden from Like Stories of Old that seeks to explore the depths of what cinema has to offer. This week, we're talking about Ridley Scott's The Last Duel. Tom, what were your expectations going into this film? What did you know about it? before you watched it. I only saw the trailer beforehand, which the thing I was most worried about is that it seemed like it was going to be this sort of single event film where it sort of reminded me at first of the some of the more recent uh, Clint Eastwood films that are uh, centered around these true events like uh, Sully, which is about the uh, the Hudson plane landing and the 317 to Paris, I think, about the uh, some citizens that stopped a terrorist attack in a train, both of which aren't like they're not bad films, but they are sort of like they are clearly films that were inspired by like a single event, like a single extraordinary thing that happened. And then they sort of engineered a story around it to sort of make it make sense as a film. And with The Last Duel, that's what I was most worried about, that we'd have this duel between the two knights, and then they sort of have to figure out like a way to turn that into a an actually interesting film that has more, that's not just filler material until we get to the actual duel, the actual fighting. And so I didn't know, like, uh, my biggest surprise going in is that it actually was, it had this three chapter structure with each chapter dedicated to a specific point of view from a specific character that's highly subjective and as you see in the later chapters is also often not necessarily mistaken sometimes so but mostly like painted in their own sort of it's biased towards each yeah, yeah. each character yeah exactly how about you I uh, similarly knew basically nothing about this film. I knew Ridley Scott directed it, but that mm -hmm. was about it. I don't know if I had even seen a trailer. So I was just going mm -hmm. in like completely blind. I had no idea what it was about, uh, which was a little bit startling. Something I'll mention now, the film deals with pretty graphic depictions of sexual assault. And so we're going to be discussing the film. So content warning, if you don't want to hear those discussions, then this episode probably isn't for you. But yeah, I didn't know what it was going to be about going in. And I was also surprised to find that it had mm -hmm. this sort of structure. I was fascinated by that. It was a really interesting experience to go into it not knowing that. Pretty quickly, I started to realize that something like that was going to be happening. It gives you a chapter marker and tells you that it's going to be from mm -hmm. a character's perspective. And then the pacing of how the events go you sort of realize like, oh, this is only going to take up a small portion of the film because it's moving through things pretty quickly. And then you yeah. get to another break and it goes back to the beginning. So I guess we can just jump into talking about the impact that the structure has on this film and sort of where the structure comes from. Yeah. The obvious connection is Rashomon, mm -hmm. which kind of popularized this format. And this film has a lot of links to that film. Rashomon was also centered around a rape and portrayed several different subjective perspectives of the characters. How do you see this as similar and how do they play on that structure and mm -hmm. perhaps change it for this film? Yeah, I think it would be smart to maybe recap it real quick. Uh, like we have the, 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 the main plot is centered around the character played by Jodie Comer, Marguerite de Carouge. We'll probably stick to the actor's name as to not embarrass ourselves with our <laughs> French. <laughs> At one point, she is um, she's married to a knight, um, 
plays by Matt Damon. And at one point where she is left alone in the castle, she is visited by Adam Driver's character, who then assaults her sexually. And what follows is then her sort of struggle to get justice, like to see justice done, which eventually results in a judicial duel, which is a now outdated duel in which two men fight each other to the death in the case of a conflict with no witnesses and no evidence. So it's basically a fight to the death and under the assumption that God stands with the righteous and the truthful. And so the winner of the duel is also seen as the one who speaks the truth and who is therefore like the, the one who should be the, the victorious party in that conflict. Right. Yeah. And we start with the perspective from um, Matt Damon's character, followed by a chapter f uh, focused on Adam Driver's character. And then at the very end, we get the perspective from Jodie Comer's character. Yeah. which uh, we'll get into that later, uh, in the, into the, the implications of her chapter also being seen as the actual truth. Right. Yeah. Like the, because in the, the first two chapters, it says the truth according to Matt Damon's character, the truth according to Adam Driver's character. But then in the third chapter, it says the truth according to Jodie Comer's character. But then all the text fades away and it only leaves the truth so it sort of right. emphasizes this is like the actual account of what happened and so in that sense that's also a basic uh or like a pretty important uh diversion uh from uh rashomon in which we don't have like one definitive true account yeah like rashomon sort of leaves it uh, more ambiguous about whose truth is correct it's been a while since i've seen rashomon but i think there you also had three perspectives there was ultimately four because you have one of them was a ghost, right? Yes. There's a samurai and his and the samurai's wife, and then there's a bandit, mm -hmm. and the bandit captures the samurai, uh, rapes his wife, and then the samurai gets free somehow. The samurai and the bandit fight, and the samurai is killed, and the wife and the bandit go free. And mm -hmm. so you see all three of their perspectives. Even the dead samurai through a medium. And then there's sort of like a fourth witness oh, yeah, yeah. that you get the perspective of. And spoilers for Rashomon, but kind of an interesting element of that film is like even the sort of objective fourth witness is kind of called into question. Like all of the perspectives are ultimately seen as sort of faulty versions and we never really get the truth, quote unquote. Yeah in Rashomon, at least plainly from the film's perspective mm -hmm. depicted. It's also because in uh, Rashomon had the additional framing device where the, the entire story, all the different perspectives are actually told by one of the witnesses who is relaying the story to right. like a fellow yes. traveler in the beginning of the film as they are taking shelter from a rainstorm. Yeah, That's, I think, the fourth witness you mentioned, like the, the witness account, which sort of is suggested at f throughout the film that this is the righteous one but then in, as you said like in the end that one also gets challenged by this second person who sort of calls out the witness for also being a liar and basically an untrustworthy person yeah so, yeah that does not exist in this in this film mm. because yeah. the filmmakers kind of plainly state their intent or their view that Jody Comer's mm -hmm. the Mar Marguerite's uh, version is true. I don't know if we did mention it, maybe we did, but this is all based on a true event, mm -hmm. based on a book, an account of this duel that happened. And so it is interesting to note, I think I was, re I was researching this a little bit before the podcast. I didn't know any of this when I watched it the first time, but there's been historical debate over what in fact happened. Like historians mm -hmm. have debated about the truth of Marguerite's account. But ultimately, the book that the film is based on leans heavily in Marguerite's favor. They, there's, I think, mm -hmm. even an account, there's written accounts that Jacques Legree, uh, Adam Driver's character, lawyer mm -hmm. in real life, even doubted his account. Um, he wrote that he was unsure of. So the rapist here, yeah. his own lawyer was was <laughs> potentially yeah. doubtful. So th historically, it seems that there's good reason to believe that mm -hmm. her account is in fact the factual one but it is sort of a statement i think of perspective by the filmmakers of saying mm -hmm. like this is where we're coming from this is what we believe about you know yeah. 
who's telling the truth in this real life scenario. Yeah, I, th I think there's like good arguments for, we'll get into like some of the character stuff later in which I think it's also revealed like why certain characters are more or less trustworthy. Right. As to the true story, I didn't know it going into the film. I, I knew it was based on true events, but I didn't look it up. So I didn't know like how the duel ended, which really made it all the more like thrilling at the end. It's, it was very tense. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of the more intense fights where I genuinely did not know what the outcome was going to be. And they, the film did such a good job at building up the stakes, especially from Marguerite's point of view, because not only is, as it turns out, is she the one who also is condemned to death in the case of her husband losing the fight, but also she had just given birth to a child who would then not only lose his father, but also his mother. So she would, yeah. like the stakes for this duel are like, the, the film builds it up so well to make this such a, like an exciting and almost like anxiety inducing final duel. Yeah. But that sort of also, I think, is one of the better, arg of the stronger arguments among historians is that, yeah, there was, in the film, I think Jodie Comer's character sort of learns later on what the stakes on her end will be. Like, she doesn't mm -hmm. know at first that she will be the one who's also uh, burned at the stake in the case of her husband right. losing the duel. But I think that in the true story, it's like more obvious that she knows what, will, what the consequences will be of her, like, uh, sort of lying. Yeah. Uh, which in the case of the duel, if her husband loses, that would mean she lies. And, you know, so yeah, in that sense, I think the that's one of the strongest arguments in general, like who really stands the most to lose, like in a case like this. Yes. And the film does that because when you really look at who stands to lose what at the end of the, in, in the final duel, it's not like Adam Driver's character who stands to lose the most. It's Jodie Comer's character and uh, right. her husband who, who have a child who stands to lose both. Yeah. His or her parents. I think she had a boy. I think it was a boy. Yeah. Yeah. The stakes are very high for her. I mean, I, Adam Driver's character stands to, to lose his life, but they even make mm -hmm. this point to, I think it's a priest or a judge makes this point mm -hmm. to Adam Driver. After the assault, Jodie Comer's character decides that they're going to accuse, you know, she, she's kind of pushed at first to be like, you know, some people recommend like, just keep things quiet. But she goes to her husband. She's like, I want justice. And so they decide to accuse Jacques. So as that's unfolding, he's receiving the accusation. In his perspective, we see conversations that he's having with not the king, but there's like a sort of barren character above mm -hmm. both Matt Damon and Adam Driver's character, who's sort of the Lord directly above both of them, played by Ben Affleck. Oh, yeah. He's sort of the first judicial court that they have to go th go to but what we see in the film is that pierre ben affleck's character is heavily biased towards adam driver so anyway there's all these discussions and someone makes the point to adam driver's character i forget if it was a priest or if it was pierre i think it was a priest like one of the uh like a secondary or like a yeah like, almost like an extra character but yeah they're like why why would she why would she be you know, making this up if she stands to lose her life, mm -hmm. like she gains nothing in the process of doing it. In fact, as soon as she says these things, even Matt Damon's character, they are sort of dishonored for even having for even accusing him. There's this sense. So there's really, there's really no upside for her to be making these things up and a lot of downside gives very strong reason to believe that she is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I think there is a case to be made for Matt Damon's character for wanting to push the duel in spite of the consequences. Like if we we can sort of get into the more character work as we were introduced to him in the first chapter. At first, he's sort of presented as the main protagonist. Like his, we begin with him as the point of view character. In his perception, he is this sort of salt of the earth, noble knight, uh, loyal to the king, loyal to God, and he is constantly wronged by basically not just Adam Driver's character, but also Ben Affleck's character and sort of the upper class that doesn't give him the respect that he is in his perception that he is due. And right. I wrote down for like for each of the characters, I wrote down like how they see themselves as characters and how they are revealed to be or how they are seen by others uh, in the other perspective. And 
for Jean or like Matt Damon's character, I wrote down that he basically sees himself as the sort of righteous protector and provider. He is seen like someone who does the right thing. Like in the very opening scene, we see him there in some sort of conflict and they are tasked with defending a bridge. But on the other side, there are uh, prisoners who are threatened to be killed by some enemy and he sort of charges them anyway. Like he does the right thing. He is guided by a moral compass. And even though he loses the battle, like, and loses battles later on, he always is seen as the one who, or at least he sees himself as the one who always does the right thing. And right. the same goes for his marriage. Like he sees himself as a good husband. I think it's fair to say, like, he sees himself as at least as a provider, as someone who has a worthy name to provide to his wife, who comes from a sort of disgraced um, family. And it's only like in the second story and the third one that we sort of see how he's really just a sort of like more self-righteous character. Like he's very stubborn, yeah. very crass almost. And as <laughs> I think it's Ben Affleck's character who says he's just like sort of boring, like <laughs> he is sort of like the, the embodiment of sort of mediocrity and not really like an important name and character as he himself believes. Yeah. So that sort of leads also, I think, into his own desire to want like some form of justice for himself and for his own character against these right. uh, who he perceives have wronged him. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts to add to Jean's character in that sense. No, I think just to touch on before we get into where this will kind of fold into talking about the perception of the other characters. Mm -hmm. But the way that these three chapters unfold, I think is a big part of what's really interesting about the film. So like, as you've already mentioned, you have Jean's perspective, and then you get Legree's directly after that. And in certain ways, there's conflict between Legree's perspective and Jean's perspective. But in certain ways, they actually reinforce each other. I, I feel like you don't really get the full vision of like who Matt Damon's character is until Jodie Comer's mm -hmm. version. And so there's this interesting, like the way in which it develops conflict between the two men and then adds this whole other layer with hers is very fascinating. And we'll get into how that develops more as we discuss their characters. The differences in perspective, sometimes they're very subtle, like it'll mm -hmm. be down to a line or a little difference in performance or something. But then sometimes they're kind of big in the opening scene of both Jean's perspective and Legree's. It starts with this battle that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. And in Jean's, he saves Adam Driver's life. And then there's this whole scene where he like, mentions that to Adam Driver afterwards and he's like thank you and then in Legree's version we actually see Legree save Jean's life and there's a reversal there yeah and that that kind of dynamic plays out several times in the film where they kind of they each see themselves as the very honorable one or the one mm -hmm. doing the right thing probably the clearest like version there's a scene that happens in all three accounts where there's this rivalry between the two even before the assault takes place they have this rivalry going on that centers around not really liking each other pierre ben affleck's character sort of being very biased towards adam driver which upsets uh, matt damon's character and then also there's a dispute over a piece of land that is supposed to be a part of the dowry for matt damon marrying jody comer that ends up ultimately going to adam driver there's this dispute over that so they have this rivalry going on and there's a point at which they kind of temporarily like make up and they both go to this like party celebration together and there's this very public moment where they like see each other across this little courtyard and they walk towards each other and they greet each other and make up and then jean very weirdly asks uh, marguerite to give legree a kiss mm -hmm. uh, as like a show of good faith and the way that scene plays out in all three versions kind of like speaks to each of their perspectives in Jean's the differences are subtle but he presents his hand first and in Legree's he presents his hand first and then in each of theirs they both say like let us be I forget the exact line but they're like one of them says let us be men and put this behind us or something like that and the other's like here here and in each of their versions they say it themselves and the others like here here well said mm -hmm. and then in jody comer's version it's actually like a third character that says that line and so there's this like shifting of 
lines and perspective and yeah. slightly different events in in each version in how they see each other and then the kiss the way the kiss is portrayed in each of those is also subtly mm -hmm. different so we'll get more into those some of those specific differences maybe as we discuss how they affect other things but i just wanted to kind of lay out some of how that's specifically mm -hmm. like unraveling um as the story goes forward yeah i was wondering do like to what extent the uh, not so much the details change in each story, but also to what extent it matters, like what scenes we are shown in which story, like, right. because of course, like to some extent, it's structured to create some dramatic structure, like to, to tell a dramatic story, which isn't necessarily tied to like what the characters actually remember. Like we see in the subjectivity of how they remember things differently. But I was wondering to what extent the scenes we are shown are actually a signifier of what they remember right yes at one point in, in matt damon's story we see i think that's after the dispute with the land happens then um matt damon sort of goes to confront ben affleck's character with uh, at some sort of festivity with adam driver sitting next to him but then before he sort of like opens his mouth like we cut to matt damon being back home and sort of recounting the story to his wife like the actual scene doesn't play out until Right. We get it from Adam Driver's perspective in which we see like he kind of made a fool of himself like and obviously there's like some sort of it makes sense like from a filmmaking perspective to sort of save that moment for later but I wonder to what extent we can also see it as sort of Matt Damon repressing the actual memory in favor of like him telling to his wife like how righteous he, he was and yes yeah the same with like the, the, the combat scenes in the beginning like he sees himself like uh, rescuing Adam Driver and Adam Driver sees him rescuing Matt Damon and I think it could be true like maybe they saved each other like it happens at right. different stages of the battle where they rescue each other so it could be true that they may as well like Adam Driver uh, I think was the first to save Matt Damon because he was sort of like it happened in the as they were charging the enemy and then yeah. Matt Damon in sort of in turn saves Adam Driver later on as they are sort of like in right. the more in the midst of combat so i kind of that's sort of interesting too to what extent like they've chosen like specific chunks of memories that the characters themselves would also focus on if they would think back to those events yeah i think that's one of the very interesting things about the way it handles the different perspectives where there are some instances where factually different things occur in the different perspectives where like a mm -hmm. line has changed or like an actual action has changed. But for the most part, the accounts aren't in sort of conflict factually with each other. With the assault specifically, Adam Driver's character maintains that he like publicly says like, I was never there. But the version of that that we see, it's not like we don't see him never going there, never assaulting her. We see his version of those actual events. And or like what you were talking about with the battle, it's very possible that they did save each other because in Matt Damon's version, we see him get saved by sort of somebody. But in that version of the scene, it's just kind of like a guy riding by who clocks another guy. You can't really tell. It's not like... Mm -hmm portrayed as this like significant event but then in the adam driver version it is like oh he obviously took action to save him so you can imagine like both of those things did happen and like you said just which your perspective of the event changes how you see things another example of that would be at the same sort of celebration i was talking about where they make up and there's a kiss later in that scene there's a moment where jody comer and matt damon are dancing and Adam Driver is watching from a distance and Jodie Comer is like looking over at Adam Driver and she's having a conversation with Matt Damon about how good it is to just like put these rivalries behind each other and a little bit of good grace and a smile goes a long way. And so we're hearing from her perspective and from Matt Damon's perspective, we're hearing that conversation and seeing her like looking over at Adam Driver and smiling. And then from his perspective, you see that again. Mm -hmm but you don't hear the conversation. And so you don't have the context of the conversation that's happening. And you only see her looking over at him and smiling, which in his perspective reads very differently. And is part of like him perceiving her as being interested in him. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I like that they do that where they're not actually changing what it is that's happening in the scenes specifically so much as just shifting the perspective of the scene or like you mentioned, maybe leaving certain moments out entirely or focusing on different things. Yeah, yeah. 
sometimes it's just adding context for that character that we didn't have. You know, in Jodie Comer's mm -hmm. version, we see her doing stuff to take care of the farm. And that's just left out of the Matt Damon version because like he wasn't there. He didn't see the things his wife was doing or he didn't you know, care about it. So we don't see that in his perspective. So I want to get I like your summary of Jean's character. So I'd mm -hmm. like to do that for the other two and, and yeah. hear your other two. So from Jean's perspective, like you said, he sees himself as kind of a protector. He sees Legree as a rival, as mm -hmm. someone who is sort of unworthy of the attention that he's getting from Pierre. And we don't see the assault happen. We just hear Jody Comer's account afterwards. He immediately is like, oh, yes, yeah, like we're going to find justice uh, for this. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of comforting and protecting of her in the process. So what's your assessment of Adam Driver's character or Legree? And how does that change maybe our perception of Matt Damon's character? Yeah, yeah. I, I found Adam Driver's character to be more difficult to pin down than Matt Damon's character. Because whereas Matt Damon seems sort of obvious, at least probably because maybe we saw his perspective first, like we saw how he sees himself and then pretty quickly it is subverted how he's actually seen in the eyes of others. But for Adam Driver, I thought at first he was sort of like someone who sees himself as sort of like a charming gentleman almost. But then the most interesting aspect of his story is that he actually remembers the rape as a rape. He doesn't Yes. Uh, he sort of like, there's some subtle differences in the way the scene is depicted. Like, for example, I think the most telling moment is in Jodie Comer's version of the story. She sort of runs up the stairs to flee from Adam Driver and sort of trips and loses her shoes. But in Adam Driver's story, she denies him and runs away. But she's, it seems like she deliberately takes her shoes off or like leaves them yeah. at the foot of the steps just to as a sort of suggestion from like, I cannot do this, but I secretly want to. But still like he does and later also admits that there was like, as he said it, there was the customary protest, like when right. it, yeah. He describes the act or the event to uh, Ben Affleck's character. So he is aware of like a wrongdoing. It's not like in his perception, it's not like a genuine act of love. Like, and it wasn't a love that was reciprocated. And that to me, like I ended up writing down that he sees himself as a sort of, or that he actually is a sort of malevolent romantic. Right. Yeah, because one of the interesting things also is that he's later in a has a discussion with a priest in which he asks, like he sort of confesses his love, he, his genuine love for Magritte, uh, Jodie Comer's character, but then asks, like, is love a sin? So he is also to some extent challenging the ways of God, I think, and mm -hmm. uh, what is ultimately a sort of basically a selfish and opportunistic way. But I think he, in his own perception, genuinely believes in a sort of transcendental love that defies even like the laws of God, how they are, at least in the way that they are sort of codified by the priests on earth. Like he believes right. that he is not above like, that, or that he is like literally above like the laws, almost like the heavenly laws as they are given shape by humanity because he sort of believes himself to be connected to some some higher form of love that sort of not justifies his little misdoings in his perception, like his little crimes, because it's it's obviously not the first time he has assaulted a woman. Like he says, like it was the customary protest, like he is, right. he is used to women resisting his advances. He sees himself as evil in like earthly terms, but I think he sort of justifies it to himself as a sort of on a more like poetic level. Yeah, and yeah. you also see it a little bit in his sort of conflict with Matt Damon's character. Like in the first story, he does he is sort of presented as a friend who is sort of inadvertently posited against him. Like he is given the land by Ben Affleck's character. He didn't have anything to do with it, and he has to collect the rent from Matt Damon. He but he doesn't really want to, and he's like trying to be friendly about it. But then in his own story, we actually see how he is much more sort of deliberate in working against. Uh, yeah. Matt Damon's character like he's he's not so much reveling in it but he's definitely like he knows what he's doing is sort of undermining Matt Damon's character and he goes along with it anyways he sees himself as above Jean because he's very well read they kind of make a point of like 
I think Jean is even presented as like illiterate. And that's a point of like connection as well that he sees yeah. between himself and Marguerite because she is, likes reading and books and stuff like that too. Mm-hmm. He sees himself as loftier sort of in a certain mm-hmm. sense than Matt Damon's character, even though like legally within the structure of this world, Legree is just a squire. Yeah. Jean is a knight, at least like in the second half of the film. Mm-hmm. Do you think he also sees himself then as a sort of savior character in the eyes of Jodie Comer? Like he's sort of rescuing this woman from a like a, a horrible marriage to a horribly boring and unromantic man. And she deserves better and he is better in his own perception. And so what he does is in that sense, like it's warranted. Like it's 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 speaking to that that sort of higher truth, that higher love that they both deserve yeah i think that's certainly how he's like trying to justify his advances at first Mm -hmm. i think even internally they kind of portray that as being difficult for the character to maintain after the fact like he clearly knows something went wrong as you as you pointed out which i think Mm -hmm. is one of the most fascinating aspects of the film i think like because you learn knowing nothing about the story before or going in when you're experiencing it cold you know that you're going to see the assault from these perspectives Mm -hmm. because you hear about it in the first one. And so my assumption going in was like, oh, this is coming from Legree's perspective. Like, we're not going to see it as an assault, but like you do. And there are those differences, as you said, but they're fairly subtle. And it's still clearly like non-consensual in both versions. It's performed Mm -hmm. slightly more like on the edge of like, you know, what you could imagine being perceived as like coyness Mm -hmm. in the first version, but like it's still clearly non-consensual. And then the second version kind of throws things into starker relief. It's interesting you talked about Adam Driver's character sort of having this pattern of from how he talks, he's clearly had women resist his advances before. And we see kind Mm -hmm. of a scene where he's hanging out in court with Pierre and there's all these women around. There's this scene where he like chases this woman around a table and then kind of like grabs her and she's like protesting a little bit but like the way it's portrayed it's like kind of this like all in good fun type of scenario you see that before you see the assault and the assault in a lot of ways kind of mirrors that moment and then Mm -hmm. when you see how things are ultimately portrayed like it like throws those moments also into question it's like we never see that moment from the perspective of the women in that moment and so it's like those scenes and how they're portrayed in Legree's version aren't sort of portrayed as assaults explicitly necessarily but then you kind of have to question the entirety of Mm -hmm. his perspective in that sense. But yeah, I agree with your overall assessment that, yeah, he sees himself as above things and then he's willing to lie and sort of manipulate the situation. Like he knows what happened and he admits to like priests and to Pierre, like, oh, there was an affair, but like it wasn't a rape. But then he lies entirely and says like, no, it just never happened. I never went there. Mm -hmm. Like, To what extent do you think that at least in his own sort of way, that he was genuinely in love with Jodie Comer's character because he does point out at one point like that he doesn't, he has no shortage of women in his life. He, I think he confesses or like it's when he's discussing it with Pierre, like, and that's, there's a sort of truth to that. Like why put himself in such a risky situation when he has like an abundance of women at his disposal, so to say. I mean, you could say maybe he was, obviously there was something in him that that singled Mm -hmm. her out but then when you take into account his actions i think it's like love from my perspective or at least my idea of like what love is you have to sort of take into account both the internal feelings of the person and how they act on the world Mm -hmm. you know in sort of evaluating whether or not something is love and so it's like he might feel like he's very in love with her but he's obviously acting in a way that does not constitute loving actions i think in the world yeah that's why i said like in his own sort of way like his own his own corrupted version of love almost right yeah one of the things i also find interesting is that towards the very end of the duel like it's clear that he's gonna lose and matt damon gives him like a chance to like even privately confess to him and still he denies like at the right last moment like the the moment that he can save or condemn his soul like he still denies and I was curious, like, what do you think that signifies? 
I will say there is historical account of that actually taking place. Like apparently mm -hmm. in the real duel, he was given a moment, uh, an opportunity to confess and he did maintain his innocence. It's worth pointing out that there wouldn't have been much point in him confessing. He would have been mm -hmm. executed even if Jean had let him live at that point. But yeah, he does you know, he's he's about to be killed. He and he maintains that he's innocent. I don't know. I think I see that as sort of like a kind of self-deception, whether he's aware of it or not, whether it, or not it's conscious, like mm -hmm. he's trying to maintain this narrative that he's acting on kind of as you as you pointed out, this like transcendent love that's above maybe even the the framework of like the duel itself. You know, he's like, mm -hmm. it's interesting because there's something I want to get to later, which is sort of their appeal by having this duel they're not just like let's duke it out and see who wins they're actually appealing to god in the sense that like they believe that god will determine who will win based on who is telling yeah. the truth you pointed out that legree maybe even sees himself above the laws of the church the laws of god and so it's it's interesting to think that he might even see the duel the outcome of the duel as not determined by god like maybe it is just a fight between two men and he's being killed even though he is right like he may not yeah. have faith in the duel as as actually determining the truth yeah i think it's also noteworthy to mention that they talk about like how Adam Driver was going to be a priest at some point, but he specifically rejected the priesthood. So yeah, yeah. there's early on like some signs that he doesn't fully agree or mesh with like the, the sort of heavenly laws as they are given shape by the church in this story or in this world. And But at the same time, he's also like a learned person, like he has read a lot. So maybe he has, it, it makes sense that he has his own vision of what it means to, or of what God means and what it means to sort of be in his grace and act with loving intentions in your heart and what ultimately sort of, what it means to uh, sort of redeem or like condemn yourself. Right, yeah. We get this conflict that's set up between these two men in the first two perspectives. And then the whole thing is kind of thrown into an interesting light given Marguerite's perspective. Not only do we get a reframing of the assault in Adam Driver's mm -hmm. perspective, but we also get a reframing of the character of uh, Jean entirely. I think that was one of the most surprising things to me where you kind of expect like, oh, there's the good side, which is Jean and Marguerite. And then there's the bad guy who is Adam Driver's character. And so you kind of expect Jean to be portrayed in a certain way going into Marguerite's perspective. And then that ended up like not being the case at all. I think that was very mm -hmm. interesting. So what did you think about her character and the way that she perceives yeah. Uh, the others. Uh, first off, I thought it was interesting to note that the first two chapters were written by uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. So they initially set out to write the script as a whole, but for Jodie Comer's part, they actually got a third, like a female writer, Nicole Holofsener. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. Anyways, um, they got like a like a female perspective, like not just in the story itself, but also like. Right. to the script which i thought was really interesting and it sort of shows like that there's like a genuine like feminine touch almost to it in a way right uh she perceives this sort of world of men like as the actually the, the mother character of uh matt damon says it to matt damon in the first story like there's no right there's just the power of men right which i think sort of nicely summarizes this world that Jodie Comer also has to navigate. She she is like clearly like um, intelligent and well read, and she has things to say and to do and to be. And but she's sort of not allowed. She's like uh, I think in her eyes, Matt Damon is a very like jealous and a sort of possessive husband who sort of keeps her locked away, almost like in a like a fairy tale princess. Uh, she's not even allowed to see her friends and not allowed to go out without like having servants uh, with her or like she's not allowed actually to stay at home alone even though that does eventually happen and he sort of berates her for dressing like provocatively and she's like by all accounts she, uh, she's like restricted to this one role of servitude to her husband yeah which yeah she obviously struggles with 
she sees herself one one of the interesting things i don't know if we've mentioned this yet but like legally within within the framework of this time period of this film that they're portraying she is treated as property and this is kind of established early on mm. when like marguerite marries jean there's a dowry it's presented as like matt damon's character needs money he's he's kind of hard off and it's a move the marriage is a move that he makes to kind of better himself in certain ways. There's a scene that's left out of the other perspectives, but like at the wedding, he's kind of haggling over this specific piece of land. Uh, and in Jodie Comer's version, they like specifically focus in on that and her perception of like at her wedding, seeing her husband and her father like haggle over like how much land he's getting for marrying her. And, you know, they kind of mm -hmm. like hone in on that. And so I think that perspective of her as his property, uh, which is how she was legally treated at the time, becomes very evident, like experientially within her version of the story. We get that very emphasized. And then there's a scene where Matt Damon's character is like breeding horses and we see how he treats these horses that he's breeding. And I think that's kind of in there to suggest this association that She's like seeing herself as just another piece of his property, like his horses or whatever that mm -hmm. is just being used to sire an heir or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so I think that whole vision is very magnified. And we see that also in his behavior. And that ultimately becomes very important in the assault where it's not seen when Legree rapes Marguerite, it's not seen as a crime against her. It's seen as a crime against Jean because... Hmm he has quote unquote damaged his property. And we see that in the scene where Jodie Comer tells Matt Damon about the assault in Jean's version, she tells him and then he immediately says, oh, you are my beloved. He like hugs her and comforts her and kind of says like, you know, she's like, I want to make things right or seek justice. And he's like, yes, we will do that basically. In Jodie Comer's version, as soon as she tells him, he's like, how can this man do nothing but evil to me? Like he immediately mm, like yeah. is like is enraged, not because of what happened to her, but because he sees this as yet another crime against him by Legree. And so I think like for me, the shift that happens in Marguerite's perspective is we see not just like the individual affront against her by Legree, which we've already seen in the other perspectives like she's in those perspectives it's kind of like an individual is assaulting her and wronging her mm -hmm. but then once we get to her perspective we get a much clearer vision of like a systemic injustice or like a systemic chauvinism like the whole world that's around her and how she's treated legally and how she's treated by her husband and in how she's treated by Legree is mm -hmm. sort of like sees her as less you know limits yeah. or oppresses her and i think that's a a fascinating move. It was one of the most interesting parts of the movie to me to just kind of portray this whole thing yeah. more systemically and less like it's not just the individuals taking action against her, but the whole mindset of the world that mm -hmm. surrounds her, even her mother-in-law and her friend in the way they treat her kind of reinforced this, this like chauvinist yeah. environment. You can really see that in the, also the scene where she is uh, at a hearing and like all the lawyers and officials, they are like really prying into her like private life and yes, details yeah. and they talk about her sex life basically and if she enjoys it or not and how she looks at other men or not like there's there's a really like shameless intrusion into her private life when it comes to when her sort of status as this property for Matt Damon is sort of uh, placed into question like she's really there's no shame on the side of these men into treating her with any sort of like dignity or like any, right. any any sort of restraint yeah. and I, i'm just now realizing like how well the horses scene functions as a sort of microcosm for the whole conflict where matt damon has bought this great like mare like and then the the unworthy stallion sort of charges in and begins to rape the horse essentially and he sort of violently yeah he like beats the horse away so yeah like, he whacks it off yeah he beats it in a way that ends up damaging both and no concern for like the well-being of the mare but may merely for its like for her reproductive like qualities like it uh, yeah it's sort of like the horse is lessened by being assaulted by another horse which is also sort of the case with 
Jodie Comer, like she becomes less valuable to Matt Damon when she is like, quote unquote, damaged right in his perception which of course like that's the stuff that really comes to light from jody coma's perspective yeah yeah and one of the things i also really thought was interesting about jody coma's perspective is that she's seen a lot like talking with like the other wives and i like that they were sort of like gossiping about also about adam driver's character like they right that she acknowledged him as like a sort of like a sort of charming but like mischievous character and even though that sort of comes back to bite her in the end. But I thought it was like an interesting point to make that it, this wasn't just some guy who she was like repulsed from from the beginning, but there was like, I think it was interesting to sort of emphasize that women can like express like some vague attraction about a man, like, or at least acknowledge other men as handsome without that being some sort of indication right of them provoking either like sexual assault or in some other way justifying like the crime that if ends up happening to her yeah, yeah. which is uh, yeah that that's just something that i thought was really really good for the film to point out i feel like it handled a lot of the details of constructing this kind of world and a lot of the complications that are involved this is a historical story but it's obviously seeing that history through the lens of you know our modern perspective on a lot of these mm -hmm. things and me too and 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 these kinds of mm -hmm. more recent events that contextualize how we see a story like this and i feel like they they did a fairly good job of handling a lot of those issues in a way that's nuanced and comments on sort of you know things we're looking at issues we're dealing with contemporarily mm -hmm. but also not feeling like totally completely anachronistic or you know it still feels grounded within the historical context yeah that's what i thought was interesting that it didn't feel like modern revisionism of like the norms and values of a, of a different age because maybe that's an interesting like segue into the role of god and the sort of god as the the the, the appeal to truth like there was like the very nature of the duel that cannot really be directly translated into modern terms, it wouldn't have the same meaning today as it would have had back then. And that's, right. I think, interesting because it, I think it still works in the sort of, in the context of the story, like, because it does once more emphasize like that within the universe of this story, like Jodie Comer's character is right. Because in this, again, in the context of this story, like God has spoken, this is the truth. That's why we label it as such in the chapter markings. But at the same time, like you can't deny, like from a modern perspective, like it's the, the result of the duel is not necessarily like a signifier of who was speaking the truth. It was merely like right. today we would see it as, oh, it's just Matt Damon's character who was stronger. Or yeah. I think as, as, as Jodie Comer's character said, like which old man will tire out faster? Like that's right. <laughs> basically all that's revealed. So yeah, yeah what, what were your thoughts on how how sort of God is handled in this way and what it would mean in our modern context. I think you mentioned earlier a line that the mother-in-law says to Marguerite, there is no right, only the might of power of men or something like that. That speaks to this theme ultimately where like they are all seeing this duel as, as we've mentioned already, you know, a revelation of like God's, God's ultimate perspective on the situation. Like we can figure out what really went down here by having these two guys fight and then we'll know the objective truth. And that's how it's portrayed. Like when Matt Damon does eventually manage to kill Legree, like the audience is kind of like, oh damn, like turns out he was a rapist. Like that's mm -hmm. the way people sort of respond to the situation. But yeah, from a modern perspective, even people who believe in God now don't generally believe that like God reveals his truth through like duels. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> it's like in a modern view, it is very much just like the truth isn't actually being discovered here. You know, it is just two old guys in mm -hmm. historical fact, they were both in their fifties. So it was like two pretty old guys just kind of like <laughs> scuffling in the mud and one of them gets killed historically and in the film it turns out that probably the one that died was actually the one who committed the wrong in in this case so that's lucky maybe there is a god <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but i think it speaks to this broader cloud that sort of hangs over the end of the film where like in one sense justice is achieved in a sense where you're like you're happy that obviously that marguerite isn't burned at the stake that like legree that they see some justice but it's still like 
they ride out of the duel and everyone's cheering for Matt Damon's character. And yeah. she is still only justified within this context of male like power and male strength. Like they literally mm -hmm. have to appeal to male strength to determine what really happened in this situation. They can't they can't believe her fully as a witness. And so justice happens in some sense but we see that like ultimately the structure within which that justice is happening is still kind of corrupt in a way that doesn't empower her mm -hmm. that ultimately is still like keeps women trapped yeah that places a very interesting twist on how the film ends you know you you can see it as a happy ending not it's not really happy you can see it as a mm -hmm. like good wins out in a sense yeah but with a lot of asterisks and some <laughs> some caveats yeah, yeah. there for sure. Yeah, it's not so much that goodness prevails for Jodie Comer's character as much as she escapes greater evil. Yes, yeah. But the sort of the real happy ending happens in the epilogue when Matt Damon goes off to the crusade and dies and <laughs> yeah. she sort of is left with the whole property and the land and the title and never remarries. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Because, yeah, I, I, there's also an interesting conversation between Jodie Comer's character and Matt Damon's mother, who, where she also reveals, the mother reveals that she was also raped and talks about how she was, how she stayed silent to sort of escape with her life. And right. Jodie Comer is sort of like, yeah, yeah but what, at what cost? Yeah. But then there was a sort of twist there. Like, a, I'm not even sure if you could call it a twist, but the moment where Jodie Comer has her child and also becomes a mother, she would sort of go back on that statement, it seems, and sort of agree with the mother. Like, right. I think, uh, like, what's right, she says something like, what's right for the child is more important than what is right for the mother, or something along those lines, which. I thought was also really interesting that she sort of like there's a sort of survival mechanism almost into taking care for this other like smaller innocent yeah life i think that does a good job of illustrating why like we see the film paints a world in which like these women are clearly aware of the oppressive nature of this world against them mm -hmm. but it also illustrates why it was so difficult for them to sort of like do what Jodie Comer's character does, which is take a stand against that and push back against that. Because not only are the stakes incredibly high for doing that, you know, like she could lose her life, mm -hmm. you know, if her husband just ends up being weaker than the other guy. And also like, you know, she has children, which she loves, which she's trying to protect and trying, you know. And so, yeah, it's a very difficult, com complicated mm -hmm. situation. And it kind of leaves you with this vision of like, you can see why things only evolved from this point towards equality so slowly like this is yeah yeah you know however many hundreds of years ago and it's taken so much time to sort of like overcome all these things because not only are they so institutional but like the obstacles in the way of like fighting against that injustice mm -hmm. the odds are really stacked against like jody comer even being like motivated to take the stand that she does in the film yeah it, it, yeah it really emphasizes at least for me like the way the sort of structural inequality that is so oppressive to her own sense of justice that it wouldn't that it wouldn't even allow for her like martyrdom like she, she wouldn't right. even be allowed to become like an, an empowerment figure for women's rights in that specific okay. context yeah. because she would just be she would be labeled as a liar and burn at the stake and in the meantime her child would grow up an orphan and no lessons would be learned almost like yeah in her perception i think yeah which sort of shows also the need for like it's not it wasn't so much that the women had to do more or like stand up for themselves or but it's really like the structure had to change and to a large part also the men in that world who have roles of power in that structure who yeah. have to change which is has been happening fortunately to some extent one of the parts where i think it was interesting to have these old like outdated gender norms just to reveal like sort of where we're coming from but also like uh to emphasize like still like how a quest for justice can be different based on what kind of power position you hold in the sort of larger society. Like, yeah. because both Matt Damon and Jodie Comer were in her their own way sort of out for justice. But for Matt Damon, it ends up very differently than it does for Jodie Comer. And also the road towards it is very differently. 
Yeah. And his agency in seeking that justice is so different. Like, you know, it's it's ultimately like his decision to push for the duel, which yeah. puts her life at risk. Yeah, I think she even needed the explicit permission of Matt Damon to pursue any action in the first right. place because she has no legal standing on her own to yeah. pursue a case like this. So it had it, it, he was dependent from the very beginning on Matt Damon's judgment, which... Yeah. As the film shows, he would agree to, but not necessarily because of her, but because of his own grievances against Adam Driver's character and uh, Ben Affleck. Any other things we missed or we want to touch on before we kind of get into main takeaways? I think lastly, I'm not sure if we've explicitly answered this already, but um, also going back to the comparison with uh, Rashomon, which did not have like an explicit truthful account, like right. what do you think that ultimately the Jodie Comer's perspective as a definitive truthful account, like what this, does that mean for the story and for how the structure with different perspectives is used? I think I like labeling her story as truthful. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, I kind of talked about how I think that's kind of a statement of obviously sort of what actually happened in the past is, mm -hmm. is sort of this unknowable entity. Like I said, there's there's historical data that can give us a pretty good idea. And, you know, it definitely seems to favor Jodie Comer's character. Based on the brief research that I did, I would tend mm -hmm. to also believe her account and think that it's probably the truth of what happened. But obviously, like, we don't have god objectively looking down yeah. <laughs> like imparting to us through a duel what actually happened so we can't know for sure so i see it kind of as a statement of belief by the filmmakers of the perspective that's being upheld and also because like they're doing more research on the historical accounts and even though there's some debate over that like the historical accounts do lean towards her perspective. So I think there's an extent to which it might be a, a little irresponsible because you're dealing with like actual events, not to sort mm -hmm. of, obviously it's a fictionalization. All those things happen in a film, but you're showing these different perspectives. If you as the filmmakers truly believe that one is the truer account, then it would make sense to not just like mm -hmm. be like, oh, we, we don't know which of these is the most. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what did you think about that? Yeah, I think historical accuracy aside, I think it does sort of shift the focus of what the main themes are that the film wants us to think about. Because in right. Rashomon, when everything is left ambiguous, the sort of main theme in that film becomes like, we cannot trust anything, everything is subjective. Like, what yeah. does truth mean? What does trust mean in other people? And I think that's uh, one of the main takeaways from Rashomon is how can we trust or how can we have faith in humanity when we cannot trust like any specific individual human being? Like, How do we bridge the gap between subjectivities? And I don't think that's the case in The Last Duel because um, while it does use similar narrative structure with the separate uh, subjective accounts, by labeling one as the truth, it's sort of more, it really becomes Jodie Comer's quest for justice and her struggle to right. achieve some form of justice in this world. And then I think it really uses the different perspectives to sort of highlight the prejudices and the sort of obstacles that are eventually in our way, both on the individual level, as the Matt Damon and Adam Driver obviously have their own individual grievances, but also in how they highlight, as we talked about, the sort of structural obstacles that are preventing her from getting her justice achieved, sort of. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. I think it's saying something different than what Rashomon mm -hmm. is trying to say. You know, it's exploring different ideas. It uses a similar structure, but it's coming at that from a different perspective, which is not about like, who is telling the truth? We can never know. That's not not, not what this mm -hmm. is about as much as it is about, like you said, individual bias and the obstacles that she's up against and kind of painting a picture of this world that she's inside of and struggling against. And by showing us the perspective of the men in the situation, it really helps us understand like what it is that she's ultimately coming up against, like that they're not just like aware of the situation and choosing to sort of assert their themselves against her. It's like they're so ingrained in the structure of this world that they're in that they actually just like believe themselves to be in the right mm -hmm. or like justified in their perspective. And I think that's really powerful. I love this maneuver in movies. There's other films that do this because I think one of the most powerful elements of film is how it can allow you to sort of enter into somebody's perspective. Mm -hmm. 
even just from a technical perspective, this movie is is a great example of how you can do that. Like if you look at the subtle differences in some of these scenes where it's like that kiss that I mentioned at the beginning, yeah, yeah. there's very little differences. And like in Jean's perspective, it's like a slightly wider shot. And in Legree's and Marguerite's, it's like a close up. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing just illustrates how like film, even just how something's edited or shot can allow the audience to enter into a perspective, into a subjective experience. In Marguerite's version, like leading up to the assault, there's very little score in a lot of the film, but like we get score, like a foreboding like score is present underneath that scene uh, in her version that's that's absent in Legree's version. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we get these subjective perspectives. It's a very powerful to th thing to do that because that effect, even when a film isn't comparing separate perspectives, we still get that effect from a film where we're often we're entering into a character's perspective. It's just a very like instructional like mode of storytelling because it, it really can of reveal to us as humans by comparing and contrasting different perspectives like this, the extent to which our own subjectivity, our own bias, our mm -hmm. own beliefs about the world or the narratives that we construct or the things like you mentioned before that we choose to remember, they all inform like our vision of the world. And that can be very different from how other people see things. So it can be a great practice and like the film holds your hand a little bit in helping you to do that and see how different people's perspectives can be constructed. And then hopefully we can take that mm -hmm. and see some of those things in our own lives and the ways in which we might be constructing yeah, yeah. A, a narrative around ourselves that differs from other people or that might unintentionally malign others around us. Even in much like less serious issues than a sexual assault, it's very possible for us to subtly oppress or malign people around us just in how we might be biased towards ourselves or towards a certain perspective yeah this is sort of moving into like the closing takeaways and final thoughts but i agree that in a general sense it was a really interesting journey into also the problem of like uh, memory and the sort of identity we associate from it like yeah as you said like it's a lot about how we can misremember things or perceive things differently and we each have our own perspective and i actually have a story from when i was a child where something like that happened when i think i was like 10 or 11 years old and my friends and i used to play uh, inline hockey you know just uh, mm -hmm. hockey on roller skates on like an empty parking lot on sunday and every now and then, like a child would join us that was like a friend of a friend. And I didn't really like him because at the slightest like joke or like uh, he would lose a point and he would become like really like obnoxious and aggressive and uh, loud. And, and so at one point I was sort of playing against him and he, I don't know what I did, but he sort of started like coming on to me. Like he was taunting me and he sort of had me cornered. And I remember like I had my hockey stick and so I sort of swung it into his nuts. <laughs> like not <laughs> not even like that hard but uh like just enough like to make him to startle him a bit and to make him crouch and so i could move past him and then i ran home and we didn't hang out much after that and we ended up going to different high schools but then years later uh we sort of hang out again or started uh there was a moment where we were hanging out again with some mutual friends and it was all water under the bridge by then and we were just yeah. like reminiscing about the good old days and uh, at one point he brought up like he was talking to like the friends of the friends how he had been apparently he had been referring to me for like years as the dentist and i was like wait why the dentist and so he was like yeah remember because that time when you had your hockey stick and you hit me in the mouth and you hit, <laughs> like a piece of my tooth and i was like he was sort of like laughing and i thought he was joking at first but right, then he yeah. would bring it up again later and i was like wait you you do know that's not what happened right like right. i never i never punched you in the mouth like yeah but he was apparently convinced like that's how he remembered that event yeah which to me like circling back to the film and how easy it is to look at a film like this and think like oh yeah memory is fickle and you can never trust your own memories but then it's really difficult to truly apply it to your own sort of history because even now like after all this after this like this film and this discussion like i'm still convinced like that memory went right. down the way i remember it <laughs> yeah yeah and it's not just because i think my memory is more like factually correct but also because 
I sort of remember my intentions and I remember who I was yeah. as a child in that period. Like I wasn't like a violent kid, like not even like out of compassion, but I knew like if I would uh, be violent, I would get into trouble and I didn't want to get into trouble. So I remember like I didn't want to hurt him. I didn't want to do like anything bad to him. I just wanted him to back off for like a second so I could go past him. It sort of shows like that the misremembering of like these, all these little details, this, it's not just about misremembering like little facts and little yeah. things. It's also about how they connect to your sort of sense of identity and your sense of self. And yeah, that was one of the things that really fascinated me about the last duel, about how that really showed how, like how people cling to certain events and they remember certain things, not just because they think that's how they happened, but also because that's how they see themselves as human beings. Like that's who they see right. as their characters. Like it's not just that their memory is like messed up. It's that they have a sense of self that they sort of project also onto the things that they experienced and their memories and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's um, basically my takeaway <laughs> from the last duel. <laughs> I, I think that's great. I think we're often way more confident in our own perspective. The phenomenon of like disagreeing witnesses is actually called the Rashomon effect mm. in court, at least in the US now, I think. The way movies like this can can help us understand those differences in perspective, I think is yeah. is uniquely, uniquely powerful. And it's something that the more we understand that, the better chance I think we have of relating to other people in our lives and understanding why other people do things too. Mm -hmm. There's often cases in which like we perceive something as such an affront against us but like you know the the person may not be acting in like they believe within their sense of self that they are justified and that can aid in empathy or you know sometimes we yeah we it, it's life is complicated and this is a mm -hmm. complicated part of yeah. life and uh yeah movies like this can can help us get a better glimpse of that world yeah I think my biggest takeaway is a lot of it was about that tension of or that tension of resolving the story, but then leaving us with this sense of there is no justice for the ultimate wrong against Marguerite. She is sexually assaulted and the assailant is killed. And so there's a justice mm -hmm. that happens in that sense. But there's this larger injustice of what leads to that assault, which is this systemic you know, oppression and this treatment of her as property. And that is not truly fully escaped within the perspective of the film. Yeah. And so that's something I was thinking about a lot. And I don't have an answer to it, but one of the questions that brought up for me in thinking about this film, especially in revisiting it again for this podcast, was this idea of sort of the parallel between in their time, they're appealing to fate to God in the outcome of the duel for justice. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting parallel between that and movie justice sometimes where you have like an actual deus ex machina where often a film about an injustice will end because like it's boring if you just end the movie with like, oh, the person got arrested and now there will be a court case and then they'll go to prison. Like that's not very cinematic. And so often because it's more exciting, because it's more interesting and it, it like appeals to something within us, often we end movies where just like by luck or happenstance, the bad guy gets killed. That gives mm -hmm. us a sense of justice for for the wrong that that occurred in the film. And that takes on an interesting tone in this movie because that happens, but it it stays within this framework of like that justice, quote unquote, is only being enacted as a part of this structure of reliance on male power, you know, as this like God essentially mm -hmm. in this in this yeah. worldview. So I think overall the film, I took a lot away from it positively. And I think it's a great exploration of of this subject matter. But kind of like, you know, how almost any war film will leave you with a little bit of a sense of like you've talked extensively about like the question of whether there can truly be an anti-war film. In the same sense, I kind of walk away from this movie thinking like the film ultimately still does kind of use this sexual assault as a way of like setting up really high stakes for then like an exciting Ridley Scott duel between two men. Mm. Yeah. And that's the climax of the movie is like two guys fighting. And that's like what makes it really exciting, you know, cinematically. And so there's an interesting tension there where, you know, in a sense, we're relying on this display of power 
and conflict as sort of the crux of like the films. Yeah. Conflict and tension. There's a really interesting moment in the duel where like for a second, we're kind of down on the battlefield. Like we've gone through the different perspectives and then we sort of end in the duel. It's not really from anyone. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's explicitly part of Marguerite's perspective anymore. I forget. I don't remember if there's a hard break, but at least like practically it shifts back into this more neutral perspective mm -hmm. and we're down on the battlefield like with Jean and with Legree. And then there's this moment where like it backs away to Jodie Comer like looking down over the battlefield and the sound kind of drops out and you can just see on her face in the performance. It's just like the hopelessness of like her fate being decided yeah. by just like two guys scrapping it out in the mud. And that yeah. is kind of weirdly juxtaposed against like the excitement of it's a uh, Ridley Scott movie where two guys get, yeah, yeah. have sword fights, you know, and uh, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know. I don't I don't think I can make a statement about whether it makes the film good or bad, but it also just speaks to the the tension of like how we portray justice and male violence and these kinds of things in mm -hmm. film, not just the world, but in film in general as well. Yeah, I was going to say like, I think Ridley Scott is really good at using spectacle and especially like violent spectacle in a meaningful way. I once did a video essay on Gladiator and how it actually uses violence to sort of tell its story also like because going back to Gladiator real quick in that film you sort of have the Commodus character played by Joaquin Phoenix who is the evil sort of emperor and every shot that he's in he is sort of given like the grand spectacle and then we see like the Maximus character the Russell Crowe the gladiator he is sort of thrown into this arena where people are basically cheering for him to do like violence and it's not just enough that he kills like the gladiator it's like specifically pointed out that he has to do it in like a spectacular way in an entertaining right. way which yeah. leads to the famous like are you not entertained scene which it's sort of like i think it's one of the few films that sort of has a cake and it eats it too <laughs> right, like yeah. because i think in the end it sort of uses that spectacle in a sort of transformative way to restore justice in the context of this world and i think the last duel works in a similar way where it sort of it has the display of like exciting action but at the same time as we talked about like the action is sort of framed in a way that doesn't hold up in our modern perception like yeah in this context it's like a fight to determine the righteous one in the eyes of god but Today, we would no longer, even if you're a believer, you probably would no longer see God as operating in that way. So it really emphasizes the sort of uselessness of that whole duel in some kind of like way to achieve justice. It only serves like the this sort of the grandiosity of the man involved and mm -hmm. highlights the hopelessness and the sort of the constraints that are experienced by Jodie Comer's character. Yeah. So yeah, in that sense, I do you think like it doesn't rely on violence as a sort of spectacle or as a sort of male savior type uh, narrative? Yeah. yeah. Though, of course, yeah, it's always still going to be like a difficult line to walk like every I'm not sure what the, where I saw this quote but like it was one critic who pointed out like whenever a film shows something it's always arguing yes like every when you're seeing violence it's always like sort of to some extent in favor of violence but it's at least saying this is worth seeing, like this is worth portraying on film. Yeah, I think The Last Duel does it with enough nuance and it constructs it also in a way that we as the audience know like how the violence yeah. is framed. And so we know like what's at, really at play here. I would agree. And that aligns with my personal experience of the film, like going into it, I wasn't watching The Last Duel and then going like, yes, you got him. Mm -hmm. Like there was a little bit of fulfillment there, but there was an emptiness in that fulfillment. So. Personally, I would agree with you. I think it does manage to walk that line fairly well, at least in my experience. I don't want to critique a film just in case some other people might have a different experience that, you know, maybe reinforces mm -hmm. something else. So people are going to experience yep. the film the way they do. Yeah. No control over that. These are just our perspectives, yeah. of course. Like, we, we, we are biased by our own subjectivities. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think, like, the, the fighting in particular is really brutal in its portrayal like mm, yeah i think more so than anything i can remember watching recently where it's really like it really kind of leans away from a very romanticized like vision of mm -hmm. medieval combat and it's like really messy and nasty i think that does help a little bit to some degree where it's not yeah. like it's not like a very pretty sword fight it's just like yeah. <laughs> kind of like awkward and not very stylized no <laughs> yeah they look like 
two guys just like struggling to mm -hmm. harm each other in their like over yeah, yeah. bearing armor and the mud and the muck. <laughs> yep. Thank you everyone for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please check us out on our creator owned streaming service Nebula, where you can listen to all of our episodes a week early. Right now, the best way you can get access to Nebula is by signing up for Curiosity Stream, which comes with a free Nebula subscription. To learn more about that, just follow the link in the show notes and we'll see you again next time.